Hello, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the History in the Bible podcast. All the history, in all the books, in all the Bibles. Episode 1.39, Solomon's Legacy. In the last episode of the History in the Bible, I laid out the basic plot of King Solomon's biblical narrative, which established him as the greatest king ever. Solomon's building projects are the centrepiece of his story. Not only does he enlist King Hiram of the Phoenician city of Tyre to carry out his program, but he institutes a corvée, a labour draft. Quote, 1 Kings 9.15 This was the purpose of the forced labour which Solomon imposed. It was to build the house of Yahweh, his own palace, the Milo, and the wall of Jerusalem, and to fortify Hatsur, Megiddo, and Gaza. End quote. The Jewish study Bible does not translate the word Milo. We don't really know what it was. The Schocken Bible translates it as earthfill. It must have been a substantial structure to be mentioned in the list. Kings elaborates on the composition of the draft. Quote, 1 Kings 9.20 All the people that were left of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, who were not of Israelite stock, those of their descendants who remained in the land, and whom the Israelites were not able to annihilate. Of these Solomon made a slave force, as is still the case. But he did not reduce any Israelites to slavery. They served rather as warriors, and as his attendants, officials and officers, and as commanders of his chariotry and cavalry. End quote. That last verse contradicts an earlier one. Quote, 1 Kings 5.27 King Solomon imposed forced labour on all Israel. The levy came to 30,000 men. He sent them to the Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month. They would spend one month in the Lebanon and two months at home. Solomon also had 70,000 porters and 80,000 quarriers in the hills, apart from Solomon's 3,300 officials who were in charge of the work and supervised the gangs doing the work. End quote. How is this different to the Egyptians enslaving the Israelites to build their cities? As we'll see in later episodes, the resentment caused by this conscription will end Solomon's dynasty in the north. The Bible praises Solomon for his wealth and power, but it is for the building of the temple that kings and chronicles regard him as the greatest of monarchs. The temple would be the physical, political and theological heart of the Judean religion and state for centuries. The temple and its host city of Jerusalem supplanted Mount Sinai as the most important site in all Judaism. It is impossible to overstate the temple's significance in the life of Jews ancient and modern. Christianity folded the temple into the theology of Jesus. Solomon's temple was the first of three. His building would be destroyed by the Babylonians and rebuilt by those returning from the exile, led by Ezra. Ezra's temple would be vastly expanded by King Herod the Great in Roman times and finally destroyed in the revolt of 70 AD. Both kings and chronicles venerate Solomon for building the temple. But the chronicler spends an entire six of his nine chapters on Solomon, describing the building and dedication of the temple, while kings spends only three of his nine. The temple was designed and built by Hiram of Tyre. It's a typical Canaanite structure. Two unusual components are a giant bronze sea and two vast pillars. The Bronze Sea, which is only mentioned in Chronicles, was some sort of giant wash basin, four metres in diameter, the size of an industrial beer vat. It was mounted on twelve bronze oxen. 
and perhaps used to purify the priests before they entered the temple proper. The pillars, each the height of a three-storey building, are inexplicably named Yakin and Boaz. We have no idea what they signified, and can only assume that they were normal Canaanite features. The Bible describes the specifics of the temple in the same loving detail it gave to the tent of meeting in Exodus and episode 1.16. The Book of Kings account ends with the material splendour of the temple. Quote, 1 Kings 7.48 And Solomon made all the furnishings that were in the house of Yahweh, the altar of gold, the table for the bread of display of gold, the lampstands, five on the right side and five on the left, in front of the shrine of solid gold, and the petals, lamps and tongs of gold, the basins, snuffers, sprinkling bowls, ladles, and firepans of solid gold, and the hinge sockets for the doors of the innermost part of the house, the Holy of Holies, and for the doors of the great hall of the house of gold. When all the work that King Solomon had done in the house of Yahweh was completed, Solomon brought in the sacred donations of his father David, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and deposited them in the treasury of the house of Yahweh. End quote. The rest of the Book of Kings will describe how all these treasures are gradually stripped away by Israel's enemies. As many others have done, the Jewish Study Bible makes a stab at calculating the dimensions of the temple. It decides on 70 by 20 cubits, call it 31 by 9 metres, for an area of 270 square metres. How does that compare to a modern Christian church? I visited an American website that provides building plans for churches at very reasonable prices. Their smallest plans accommodate a congregation of 130 to 230 souls. These churches occupy about 550 square metres, twice the size of Solomon's temple. The temple was not meant to house a people at prayer, but still, Solomon's temple was no gargantuan edifice. Solomon's final project is to build his own palace. Showcasing Solomon's hubris, the Book of Kings describes this as even grander than the temple. The temple was built in seven years, the palace in thirteen. Solomon's abode was five times the area of God's house, about the size of the American president's residence, the White House. With the temple built, Solomon moves the Ark of the Covenant from Gibeon to God's new house. God appears to Solomon for a second and final time to reassure the great king that he will abide in the temple forever if only the king will keep his ways. The book of Chronicles ends its story of Solomon at this pinnacle of piety. But the author of Kings, the Deuteronomist, has a few more things he wants to get off his chest. Immediately after Solomon's death, the mighty kingdom was sundered in two. How could this have happened to the dynasty of David? God had promised that the dynasty would rule forever. The Deuteronomist has an explanation. Back in episode 1.23, I mentioned that one of the Deuteronomist's fixations was that all of Israel's ills could be traced back to its failure to worship Yahweh alone to go chasing after alien gods. The author of Kings explains it thus, quote, 1 Kings 11.1 1. King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Phoenician and Hittite women, from the nations of which Yahweh had said to the Israelites, none of you shall join them and none of them shall join you lest they turn your heart away to follow their gods. He had 700 royal wives and 300 concubines. In his old age, his wives turned away Solomon's heart after other gods. And he was not as wholeheartedly devoted to Yahweh his God as his father David had been. Solomon followed Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Phoenicians, 
and Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. End quote. You just can't trust foreign women, can you? Oh dear. In the final chapter that Kings devotes to Solomon, God sends three adversaries to afflict him. One is Hadad, king of Edom. Another is Rezin, king of Damascus. But the greatest is Jeroboam, Yoravam, Solomon's trusted high commissar of forced labour. While about his duties, Jeroboam is accosted by a prophet. Quote, 1 Kings 11.29 During that time, Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, and the prophet Ahiyah of Shiloh met him on the way. He had put on a new robe, and when the two were alone in the open country, Ahiyah took hold of the new robe he was wearing and tore it into twelve pieces. Take ten pieces, he said to Jeroboam. For thus said Yahweh, the God of Israel, I am about to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hands, and I will give you ten tribes. But one tribe shall remain his, for the sake of my servant David, and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city that I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. End quote. As a side note, Ahiyah says that of the twelve tribes, ten will go to Jeroboam and one to Solomon. Okay. So, who is the missing tribe? Thus cursed, Jeroboam does what any sane underling would do. Jeroboam works for an absolute monarch who has no compunction about eliminating rivals. A prophet has just told him that he will usurp his boss. Jeroboam flees the kingdom on the fastest donkey train he can find. He ends up at the court of Pharaoh Shashok, out of Solomon's reach. Shashok is the first named Pharaoh in the Old Testament, at last. He is also the very first historical figure we can cross-reference with the Bible's narrative. Shashok is almost certainly Shashok I, founder of Egypt's 22nd dynasty, a line of Libyans who would reign over Egypt for much of the life of the two kingdoms. I'll be getting to them in later episodes. With Jeroboam under the protection of Sheshonk, Solomon dies, to be succeeded by his idiot son, Rehoboam, Rehavam. Before we move on to the modern scholarly assessment of the United Kingdom period, let's take a look at the many works attributed to the great King Solomon. These are all part of what Christians label as the wisdom literature, and what Jews place into the third division of the Hebrew Bible, the writings. Let's follow the Christian tradition for the moment, since the Jewish one is unhelpful in making sense of it all. Protestants have five books of wisdom, all of which are in the Tanakh. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs. The last three are all attributed to Solomon. Catholics, Ethiopians and Orthodox also include the wisdom of Solomon, amongst others. However you cut it, most of the wisdom literature is attributed to Solomon. The biblical wisdom literature is part of an ancient Middle Eastern tradition. Apart from its insistence on monotheism, there is nothing that really sets it apart from the many books written in Egypt or Mesopotamia. It makes no claim to divine revelation. It says nothing about the Hebrew nation. It's simply observational wisdom advice and counsel that can be weighed by experience. Let's start with the first book attributed to Solomon, Proverbs. We all know that Solomon wrote Proverbs. Quote, 1 Kings 5.29 And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and largeness of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East, and all the wisdom of Egypt. He also uttered three thousand proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. And men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. End quote. Proverbs is the second book of the writings in the Jewish tradition, 
and the third book of the wisdom literature in the Christian. Once it was believed to be a very late composition, written well after the exile. With the discovery of old Egyptian analogues, most now think it dates to the heyday of the two kingdoms, three centuries earlier. Proverbs is the quintessential book of wisdom. It promotes wisdom as the means of social tranquility and a happy life. Proverbs values hard work and diligence. Proverbs recommends honesty in your business affairs and kindness and loyalty, impartiality, sobriety and humility, restraint and sincerity. Wealth is very nice, but it's not to be desired at the cost of serenity and peace. The book of Proverbs is complacently certain that the righteous and the wicked of the world receive what they deserve in life. Unlike many other books in the Bible, such as Job, Ecclesiastes, and many of the prophets, Proverbs never questions God's just providence, never has a single doubt. The wise person's deeds are good and will bring them happiness and success. The foolish person's deeds are evil and will lead to failure and ruin. The many Proverbs can be divided into three groups. The first introduce the semi-divine being called wisdom. A second group is the one most people associate with Proverbs, common sense aphorisms. The final group could be called career advice for the budding courtier. The first group is strikingly different to the other two. The first nine chapters of the book are a series of speeches from a father to a son. A female divine being called Wisdom figures prominently. Wisdom is clearly a separate individual from God. Quote, Proverbs 8.1 It is wisdom calling, understanding raising her voice. She takes her side at the topmost heights, by the wayside, at the crossroads, near the gates at the city entrance. At the entryways she shouts, O men, I call to you. My cry is to all mankind. O simple ones, learn shrewdness. O dullards, instruct your minds. An important Jewish tradition has it that wisdom was the embodiment of the Torah and was created before the world. As Proverbs 8.22 puts it, quote, Proverbs 8.22 Yahweh created me at the beginning of his course, as the first of his works of old. In the distant past I was fashioned, at the beginning, at the origin of earth. He had not yet made earth and fields, or the world's first clumps of clay. I was there when he set the heavens into place, when he fixed the horizon upon the deep, when he assigned the sea its limits, so that its waters never transgress his command, when he fixed the foundations of the earth. End quote. You might note there a hint of the old Canaanite preoccupation, with the waters of chaos threatening the natural order of the world. There is much debate as to how the Israelites acquired the idea of the divine entity wisdom. The notion comes perilously close to challenging Judaism's strict monotheism. The closest analogue to wisdom is the Egyptian goddess Maat, who represented order, truth and justice. Christianity interpreted the divine being wisdom as Jesus. Here is Paul writing to the Colossians, quote, Colossians 1.15 Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were created all things in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. End quote. Many of the sayings in Proverbs are two-liners. Here is a smorgasbord. Quote, a capable wife is a crown for her husband, but an incompetent one is like rot in his bones. Better to be lightly esteemed and have a servant than to put on airs and have no food. The righteous man eats to his heart's content, but the belly of the wicked is empty. A pauper is despised even by his peers, but a rich man has many friends. A hot-tempered man provokes a quarrel. 
A patient man calms strife. Pride goes before ruin, arrogance before failure. All the brothers of a poor man despise him. How much more is he shunned by his friends? End quote. If you were puzzled by some of these, then welcome to the club. An important slab of the Proverbs seems to have been modelled on an Egyptian work known as the instruction of Amin M. Ope. I hope I've pronounced that halfway right. 30 Chapters of Advice for Successful Living Since its discovery in the late 19th century, scholars have argued about its date and its relation to the Book of Proverbs. The current consensus is that the instruction was written somewhere between the time of the judges and King David. That makes it earlier than Proverbs by at least a century, and almost certainly much more. Consider this passage. Quote, Do not rob the wretched because he is wretched. Do not crush the poor man in the gate, for the powers will take up their cause, and despoil those who despoil them of life. Do not associate with an irascible man, or go about with one who is hot-tempered, lest you learn his ways and find yourself ensnared. Do not remove ancient boundary stones. Do not encroach upon the field of orphans. End quote. Now, this passage. Quote, Do not move the markers on the borders of fields, nor shift the position of the measuring cord. Do not be greedy for a cubit of land, nor encroach on the boundaries of a widow. If you find a large debt against a poor man, Make it into three parts. Forgive two. Let one stand. Better is praise with the love of men than wealth in the storehouse. Better is bread with a happy heart than wealth with vexation. Do not befriend the heated man, nor approach him for conversation. End quote. One of those passages was from the instruction. The other from the book of Proverbs. I'll leave it to you to work out which is which. Proverbs concludes with a poem that pious Jewish husbands traditionally recite to their wives after they have returned from the Sabbath evening service. Quote, Proverbs 31.10 What a rare find is a capable wife. Her worth is far beyond that of rubies. Her husband puts his confidence in her and lacks no good thing. She is good to him never bad. All the days of her life she is like a merchant fleet, bringing her food from afar. She rises while it is still night, and supplies provisions for her household. She girds herself with strength, and performs her tasks with vigour. Her husband is prominent in the gates, as he sits among the elders of the land. End quote. The husband has spent the Sabbath fulfilling his pious obligation, which simply means hanging out with his mates. While the man has been avoiding any sort of domestic drudgery, the woman has been preparing a bang-up Sabbath meal. The husband expiates for his utter lack of physical labour by saying a poem. Sometimes the Bible is so sexist, I just want to scream. Throughout the ages, men have been brilliant at telling women, no, That's your job. I am off to do important things with my buddies. A second book ascribed to Solomon and present in all Bibles is the Song of Solomon, also known as the Song of Songs. In older Catholic Bibles, it is called Canticles. In the Jewish tradition, it is in that part of the writings called the Five Scrolls, together with Ruth, Esther, Lamentations and Ecclesiastes. At about 2,000 Hebrew words, the Song of Solomon ties with the Book of Ruth as the shortest book in the Hebrew Bible. The two books are unique in that neither mentions God. Because Christians split the twelve minor prophets into separate books, they have several even shorter ones, Obadiah, Haggai, Nahum and Jonah. The usual interpretation is that the book is a discourse on erotic love, a set of poems where a man and woman alternate speaking to each other. Although attributed to Solomon, it seems to have been finalised in the Hellenistic period, 
sometime after 300 BC. Here is a typical passage. Quote, Song of Solomon 1.7 Tell me, you who I love so well, where do you pastor your sheep? Where do you rest them at noon? Let me not be as one who strays besides the flocks of your fellows. If you do not know, O fairest of women, go follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your kids by the tents of the shepherds. I have likened you, my darling, to a mare in Pharaoh's chariots. End quote. Did you find that sexy? Okay. Perhaps this passage will turn you on. Quote, Song of Solomon 4.2 Your teeth are like a flock of ewes, climbing up from the washing pool. All of them bear twins, and not one loses her young. Your lips are like a crimson thread. Your mouth is lovely. Your brow behind your veil gleams like a pomegranate split open. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built to hold weapons, hung with a thousand shields, all the quivers of warriors. End quote. No, still nothing. To the rabbis, this was dangerous pornography. They allegorized it as the words that God and the nation of Israel spoke to each other at the Red Sea or at Sinai. Christians allegorize it as describing the relationship between Christ and the church, or Christ and the individual believer. We know that the rabbis argued whether the book should be included in the Torah. What we do not know is how they reached their decision. Was it included in the Bible because it was allegorized? Or was it included in the Bible first, then later allegorized to justify its inclusion? In the next episode of The History in the Bible, I finish my survey of the books attributed to Solomon and enlist modern scholarship to work out what we can make of the entire period of the United Kingdom. Thanks for listening.